Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the webinar series, uh, Critical Canadian Building Science. I'm uh, Gord Cook, be your host this afternoon, facilitator this afternoon. This particular session is on, a, I think, an interesting topic. One I get about every three years, it seems to go around and round about, uh, you know, what are we going to do about big exhaust appliances and ever tighter houses, specifically net zero ready homes, but it could be any any tight house. So we have a, a nice little agenda planned for you, but we'll just wait a minute or two and let uh, a few other folks uh, sign in. And uh, Stacey, you'll let us know uh, how we're doing for, for numbers. Yeah, we're expecting uh, around 132 today. Great. We're always so appreciative of people listening in. I know everybody has busy days um, and obviously Others may want to listen to it later or watch it later, but uh, we really appreciate people's interest in these uh, these kinds of technical topics. This is a, I'm going to say a specific little niche market, but as you'll learn today, it's a, it can be a real challenge for builders. So we'll just may wait another minute or two. Well, perhaps, um, Stacey, do you think we should get started? Yeah, go ahead. You know how this builder group is. They got to grab their lunch and sit down, and they'll be here eventually. <laughs> Fair enough. So I'll, I'll say once again, uh, welcome to the webinar series, Critical Canadian Building Science. This particular session is... Uh, uh, to do with uh, how to handle large exhaust appliances in ever more airtight houses. Uh, I'm Gord Cook with Building Knowledge Canada. We're always pleased, so pleased to be working with Enbridge on this series. I'll have Joanne uh, introduce herself in just a second, but very pleased and proud to be working with Enbridge to bring this kind of technical information to the industry on a regular basis. And really want to thank you for joining in. You'll also see I have uh, two panel guests with me who I'll introduce a little more formally in a second, but uh, for the next hour and a half, um, we want to chat about this technical issue around airflow, depressurization, indoor air quality, uh, the attributes around or the elements around making that work in tight houses. And that does give me an opportunity to uh, introduce Joanne Van Panos from Senior Analyst from Enbridge. Joanne, would you like to say a few words? Hi, yes, thanks, Gord. So we'd like to start today's session off by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional and historical lands of the original people of Turtle Island, who have been the caretakers of these lands since time immemorial. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Our acknowledgement of this reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources of and relationship to Indigenous peoples, and we have a responsibility to honor that. And thank you for that. And then uh, we just wanted to highlight uh, who our builders and HVAC should call if they need any help with anything. So we have two numbers. Basically, uh, if you're a builder or HVAC, you can contact our attachment center uh, for any new gas services or get connected questions pro for project and subdivision questions, meter sets, final inspections, and construction heat. Uh, but if you have any questions with regards to any kind of cutoffs at Maine for demolition work, any form issues, billing questions, damages, or infractions, then you should be contacting our customer care center. Thank you. And then we also like to start off all of our sessions with a quick safety moment because safety is our number one value. Uh, just to highlight what to do if you do damage a natural gas line, it happens. You know what? Our construction sites are very busy. We ask that you stop work immediately and make sure you clear everyone from the area. Please call 911 if you smell or hear gas escaping. They are the best equipped to dispatch any emergency services and they can contact us directly. Um, 
Otherwise, you can call, or in addition to that, you can call our Enbridge Gas Emergency Line at 1-866-763-5427. And thank you very much. I'll hand that back over to you, Gord. Thank you. And so here's our agenda for the afternoon at one o'clock start, 2.30 finish. Uh, try to finish the formal presentation by about 2.15 so you have time for questions. But in terms of what we want to chat about today is this challenge of large exhaust appliances in homes with great air barriers. And I, I wrote that specifically to think about uh, from an air quality perspective, we really would like to get rid of pollutants. So large exhaust. Um, uh, over top of ranges, maybe even dryers is great, but we don't want to give up on great air barriers because air barriers or air tightness is a critical element of durability of the building. So wanted to man to to mention both of those items, and it it, it is a challenge from a depressurization and combustion safety, and um, but it's also a challenge from the appropriate amount of exhaust of intermittent pollutants. Uh, you know, our general pollutants, regular pollutants, we. We handle generally with balanced ventilation, the heat recovery or energy recovery ventilation. These, these the pollutants we're speaking of, or at least the exhaust plants, is more uh, geared towards intermittent pollutants. And I, I wanted to ad address today or talk to you today. We have a specific sections on the standards that help address these challenges. One is the new version of the F three hundred standard, which is the residential depressurization guidance. And second is an ASTM standard that uh, one of our guests is going to speak to, which is on the uh, capture efficiency of domestic range hoods. And then third, or sorry, the last bullet points, uh, thinking about one of the solutions being make up air. How do we how do we do it? When? How do we know when we do it? Uh, no, sorry, when we need it? And and how do we do it? How do we do it appropriately? So those are topics for discussion. Um, as always, we would suggest you put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, that helps us record them better, make sure they get answered um, uh, in completely. If you do have comments or questions uh, associated with perhaps uh, difficulties with signing in, then you would go to the chat, but otherwise uh, Q&A. Um, I'll just introduce myself quickly. Uh, professional engineer, been in the industry. This says 25 years. I'm gonna update it when I update my picture with more gray hair. It's more like 35 years now. Um, I work a lot in the HVAC world, but uh, obviously in the uh, in the high performance building uh, section as well. And um, so uh, uh, pleased to be your host uh, this afternoon. Also have with us uh, Martin Larock, who's worked uh, in in the uh, ventilation industry for more than fifteen years. He's part of the Brown Newtone uh, Venmar team in the kitchen ventilation for over seven years. He's a ma active member of HVI, the Home Ventilating Institute, which is the the organization that uh, that the ventilation folks all belong to, the ones who set the standards for uh, airflow performance, for example, of bath fans, range hoods, and so on. And he is um, uh, working directly on this uh, range hood standard and is going to share with you today, primarily talking about the capture of uh, effectiveness of uh, standard that the ASTM standard. But uh, Martin, just say hello, and then we'll come back to you later. But if you wouldn't mind, just say good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thanks for joining us, Martin. It's uh, kind of you to spend time. And then I'll I'll mention uh, Stephen Snyder. Stephen uh, is, well, everybody in this call is a fantastic builder, but I've had the great pleasure of working with Stephen over the years. Uh, you know, high-performance builders uh, specialize in quality, energy efficiency from foundation to roof. I always looking to improve. Stephen, you were uh, young at the time, but an R one of the early R2000 builders. Um, I always interested in the technology. Uh, I, I know of houses. You always have great questions of us. And this is, a I know a topic, the reason we asked you on is this is a topic you run into. Incredibly tight houses with high expectations of consumers. I'm going to ask you to speak to that in a minute. But if you wouldn't mind, um, just just say good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, looking forward to the chat. And as as I recall, Stephen, you were saying earlier, the biggest challenge of all, you you are building the toughest house possible. You right now, you're busy building a house for who? Myself. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is that one, right? yes, yeah. And you were saying this is your last house, so I don't I don't believe that, but you say it's the last one you're going to build for yourself. This is. 
this is going to be my last house. I'm going to retire in this house. So that's, uh, I don't think I've got it in me to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> so let's make sure we get it right. That'll be yeah. it. Thanks, Stephen. And we'll come back to you in just a little bit. Um, Stacy, you always like to just remind us of some of the uh, housekeeping elements, if you wouldn't mind. I do, because I like the questions that come out of all of these webinars, and it's always good for us to have them in the Q&A um, for the presenters, because they can see it in a way that is different than how they see the chat, but it's also a way that it gets captured in the back end. So we welcome those questions, so make sure they go in the right spot. If you want to answer some of the stuff that's not covered in any of our polls, you can put that in the chat. That's the best spot for that. Or if you just want to say hi from Quebec, and you can do that in the chat. That's perfect. Um, the Survey Monkey um, link, I'm just putting that out there right now. We welcome the feedback. So you'll also get one sent to you as well once the webinar is um, finished. And I send all this information along with this beautiful slideshow after it's all said and done with some good resource materials, our newsletter links, all that stuff, um, where to find out how to sign up for more of our webinars. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the closed captioning button down there, it's in between usually your um, the polls and the, the share screen spot. Depends on if you're listening through your phone or on a laptop, it'll be in a different spot. But it works out really well in case you miss something. You can see it written out in a transcript as well. So that's it for that part. And uh, enjoy the webinar. Thanks. And you're going to run a couple of polls for us, uh, Stacey, just to see I who am. We kind of like to know who you are, what you do, so you wouldn't mind. Wait, the first one we've got, let's see where everyone's from, I guess. So I'll try to answer them quick. We've got a lot of information to go through. So We do, we do. And we'll just see. We'll see from Ontario today, Gord, but we've got some from the Atlantic provinces in BC, Alberta, Quebec. There you go, Martin. <laughs> okay, I'll share those. Good. Nobody from the US today. We often have a, a good friend of ours, Armando, sometimes a, a, a comes in, but uh, thanks, yeah. folks, for joining us. Yeah. yeah, we've had ones from Belize, I think, that one time. That was nice. Right. <laughs> you know you're important when they want to go in from that. Uh, I think he told me later him. he was on vacation and <laughs> was listening in. And so right. now it's your occupation, if you wouldn't mind. We were chatting. Yeah. yeah, so it's up there. You just want to hit enter there, Gord, on your end. It just has the um, poll show up of what we've just yep. done today. Okay. So, yeah. That's good. If you have typed in other it's always great to tell us what we've missed and put that in the chat that's perfect we haven't captured everyone who's a builder engineer consultant it's great so let's go ahead and show those results there we go thank you oh great first and nation housing yeah awesome oh very nice um, so a, a really nice uh, assortment. I really appreciate that. Thanks, folks, for doing that. It gives a sense of who we're chatting with. So really appreciate that. Uh, we did that one. Yep. Yeah. Good. Um, so I'll, I'll just highlight again that, that this topic is really about uh, managing pressures in buildings, this tight houses, large exhaust, managing pressures, and understanding the impacts on combustion safety understanding the impact on proper oper operation of exhaust appliances and understanding the overall topic of indoor air quality because typically those exhaust appliances are to get rid of pollutants that we just don't want any part of for any length of time in our houses. So how do we how do we manage the air quality concerns of intermittent pollutants without, uh, uh, I would say, and still have the ability to manage pressure? So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, you should be seeing an animation now. This is a construction instruction animation. You know, for centuries, we've been burning fuels inside of dwellings, and we expected those products of combustion to go up the chimneys by the natural buoyancy of warm air. It's only been in the last 30 or 40 years that we now have this competition of large exhaust appliances. So with old fireplaces and so on, we didn't have to worry about the bin for 1200 range hood. Now we do have to worry about. And 
is and what wins is it the natural draft chimney or is it the exhaust appliance and there is a very real danger of at a code level we started addressing that in 1990 the ontario building code changed that discouraged or at least i'll say encouraged a different approach um, to chimneys and houses they encouraged people to go to direct vent sealed combustion uh, didn't eliminate chimneys chimneys altogether but we've known about this for say at least since 1990 well well before that but that's really the first element here is that backdraft potential that we want to think about and when you think about combustion safety i always like to show a water heater because it was kind of the quintessential laziest venter in a house and in terms of what that appliance needed down at the bottom left it needed air for combustion that is the air that was actually burned in the construct in the combustion process and a water heater didn't need a lot of air, 15 to 30 cubic feet per minute, but it was actually consumed from the house. And you can imagine over time, if you had a really tight enclosure, small house, if the water heater was running for long periods of time, ultimately there would be less and less air or oxygen available in the house and uh, for that, that burn. More importantly, or as importantly at the top, is the dilution air that was required. This was air that was going up the chimney to control the draft. And furnaces and water heaters both have this, as do um, uh, fi fireplaces, but it was very distinct in water heaters and easy to show. And in fact, there was more air that went up the chimney associated with dilution air than was actually consumed for combustion air. But if either of those is lacking, then we have air quality problems and we could present the opportunity for backdrafting air coming back down the chimney. And so then on the right hand side, I'm showing the interest in makeup air. If, if, if we don't have adequate leakage in a building, then we need in, to intentionally put in a pathway for air to come into the house to replace the air that's lost through combustion and through dilution. So that's the combustion safety. The good news is we know a fair bit, a lot about combustion safety. And that was actually put in a standard uh, quite a few years ago called F300, Residential Depressurization Guidelines. And we know in, in Canada, we've, we, we have a good sense of the limit of depressurization that natural draft chimney will overcome. Imagine the buoyancy of warm air, heated air, that we know it rises uh, uh, and creates a pressure, or at least is able to overcome a pressure of about five Pascal of pressure. Now, what's a Pascal? Well, a Pascal is like a very light pressure, very light pressure, like in the order of two to th the pressure you might feel in a two to three kilometer an hour wind, that, that kind of pressure. Um, and so it's not a great pressure that it can overcome, but normally if there's nothing else going on, it can overcome that five Pascal limit. The, the key is, is the range hood, the dryer, the bathroom vans, are they creating a pressure greater than five Pascal? And it's a function of the size of the house and the leakiness of the house, of the enclosure of the house, as to whether those appliances will do that. So five Pascal limit. We have a second concern. So even if you looked after the combustion appliances, the spillage susceptible appliances, we still have a concern about the proper operation of the exhaust appliances. After all, every fan uh, that you put into your house has a specific capacity and it has a capacity against its own negative, the pressures uh, surrounding it. And in order to understand this issue, you need to have an appreciation for when they say a bathroom fan, for example, moves 50 cubic feet per minute of air, it always has to list at what static pressure, at what pressure of what resistance. And bathroom fans and range hoods are uh, tested typically to 25 Pascal of pressure. And that includes the resistance of the ductwork, of any hoods, and the pressure of the building that it might be in. And if the pressure created by the fan is more than 25 or say 50 Pascal, then in fact that the fan isn't going to move as much air as it was intended to move. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. It's understanding what's known as the fan curves of the exhaust appliances to recognize that fans move different amount of air at different resistance levels. And if we are creating resistance, if the envelope itself is creating resistance, then the fan's not gonna work the way it should. And as I say, there's this 
updated standard in place. It's going to be referenced in the new National Building Code. That's pretty helpful um, at helping d decide, uh, you know, what's the right amount of depressurization, how much makeup air do I need, what are the circumstances I might need them under. And specifically on um, uh, combustion appliances, we are most concerned with natural draft appliances, wood burning fireplaces, gas logs, that for the most part, right, we've converted to direct vent sealed combustion furnaces, gas fireplaces. We're most concerned about natural draft. So for builders who are still doing wood burning appliances or gas log sets, that combustion uh, spillage is, is, is pretty critical. And tight houses with large exhaust can cause negative pressure. And I mentioned before, it's really a minus five Pascal or 0.02 inches of water. That's an interesting one. When, when you think about, you know, if you're sucking water up from a, say from a pop can up in up a straw into your mouth, you're exerting about six inches of negative pressure, six inches. You can all imagine that pressure, how much pressure that is. Now I want you to imagine a pressure of 0.02 inches of water. How much pressure would it take to suck water up 0.02 inches? And you go, oh, that's a very light pressure. That's the pressure at which a chimney can uh, realistically overcome. And we'd want to make sure that we don't have higher pressure than that. And in a combustion appliance world, we would say, you need to test. This is serious enough that you would need to know whether your house is going to go negative more than five Pascal. And if it goes more than five Pascal negative, you have three choices. One, you could switch to a sealed combustion direct vent appliance. In other words, get rid of the chimney. Two, you could lower the airflow of the exhaust appliance that's causing the negative pressure. Or three, you could add makeup air um, as, as part of the decision or at least part of the solution. So that's in a, a combustion spillage appliance. And that combustion safety, as I say, switch to direct vent, sealed combustion, or all electric as we move to heat pumps. Um, on the right on the right hand side, you're seeing power vented. Power vented still has a slim percentage of backdrafting. And there's some local billing officials, uh, municipal billing officials would say, eh, I still need to, you to worry about that and provide combustion air or make up air for those appliances as well. But typically these kinds of appliances get rid of that five Pascal limit, if you will. But the one I wanted to speak to then uh, as we move along is what about the proper operation of exhaust appliances? And the new F300 standard has set a limit of 25 Pascal of pressure. And I say limit because there's ways around it. You can do performance path and so on. But it's basically saying if a house goes more than 25 Pascal negative with the operation of an exhaust plants, a number of annoying things are going to happen. The range hood in this case isn't going to work the way you thought it was going to work. It's not going to move as much air and therefore it's not going to take out the pollutants the way you thought it was. Two, the house is going to be under negative pressure and things like doors may open up or you may uh, uh, notice annoying drafts or whistling around windows. So it's important that we understand there is a now a limit on the exhaust that you create on an intermittent basis, intermittent basis, and try to be below that or uh, designed to be below that such that you don't get uh, uh, complaints from your homeowner about either the range hood not working correctly or causing these annoying drafts, whining and, and so on. And so I wanted to help you with that um, and, and understand how, uh, how we do this. So it, it, when you think about turning on a range hood, it's exhausting air out. Somewhere air's got to come in unless the house is getting smaller. So the house goes negative. It could cause backdrafting of chimneys, but it really ends up having this back pressure against a range hood. And I see this in my own house, a house that's incredibly airtight you know, under 0.6 air change per hour, it's about 0.2 air changes. When I turn on the range hood, the range hood goes, it literally can't move air. It's designed to move 250 CFM of air, but under this negative pressure that it's created on its own, it now moves less than 60 CFM of air. So I don't get very good performance out of the range hood if it's moving about a third, about a quarter of the amount of air it was supposed to move. So this is the challenge and you're going to see in, in airtight houses, the range hoods just don't work very well. And this is the essence of it technically. These are called fan curves. Let me try to describe it to you. Along the bottom axis is airflow. Along the vertical axis is static pressure, resistance to flow. And notice the range hood off to the right there. 
the blue line is showing the range hood curve, the fan curve, showing it in a vertical high speed seven inch round duct. And it says sitting on a bench with no duct work and no resistance, no resistance to flow, it moves 350 CFM of air. Hmm. That fan is tested at 25 pascals, Pascal or 0.1 inch of water. Now that fan will only move 250 CFM of air. But when you get a rating, say from Brown, and they say this fan's rated for 250 CFM, it's rated at a back pressure of 25 Pascal, which is, um, uh, as I say, 0.1 inches of water. And that's taking into account or imagining there's ductwork, there's a hood, and it hasn't really thought about the house at all. But what if the house was at, say, uh, uh, set a 50 pascal of pressure. And so now we have a back pressure of say 75 pascal of pressure. That fan curve, notice now it only moves 50 CFM. So you bought a fan that's supposed to move 250, but it created a pressure in a house as much as uh, 75 pascal. And now you're only moving 50 CFM. And so hopefully now you get to see the issue or the challenge with that, that, that this is a real concern, the tighter the house, the larger the fan, if you want to get its true capacity, you have to have enough air available that it can properly exhaust the uh, the, the uh, intended capacity, if you will. And what I would say to you is the good news is in high performance net zero houses, if you're not blower door testing your houses, start because the blower door tells you exactly how much air it takes to create a pressure of 50 minus 50 or minus 25. So the minute you have a blower door test or even a history of blower door tests in your houses, the results at minus 50 Pascal can be interpolated really easily by your energy rater. Any energy rater that your energy advisor you're using will know how to do this, should know how to do this. If they're on this call, and if they don't, give me a chat later and I will uh, show you how to do it. But you can interpolate the results. So let's say, for example, you're at a house that's one air change per hour. In order to create a pressure, you all know, put the fan on a thousand CFM to create that 50 Pascal pressure, you know, if you put in a range hood that's bigger than a thousand CFM, your house is going to go 50 Pascal negative. The blower door proved that to you. Took a thousand CFM to create a 50 Pascal pressure. If it's, if you have a fan that's at bigger than a thousand CFM, you're going to be at minus 50 and the fan's not going to work very well. But then you would interpolate that down to minus 25 and say, here's the biggest range hood I can put in or the biggest exhaust vent I can put in and still be able to maintain pressures lower than minus 25. So you compare that to your fan, you specify the fan based on that. And if your client needs, or if you decide you need larger exhaust appliance than that, then you would say, then I need to know I need makeup here. And again, the Blower door results will help you determine exactly how much air you need for makeup to bring you down to that 25 Pascal limit. And typically in most houses with reasonably sized range hoods, that means a hole of a six inch to eight inch diameter meets, I'm going to say 90% of uh, makeup air results, unless you're into some sort of commercial cookery or something. Most range hoods and capacities, leakiness of houses, a six to eight inch diameter makeup air is, is what you're going to need in your houses. And makeup air um, is, is nothing, and it typically is needed um, in, in houses where there are chimneys. You're almost always going to need in high performance houses makeup air, because remember you need to get down to that five Pascal limit. And as I've said before, if they're over minus 25, you definitely need it. And the tighter the house, the greater the chance of needing makeup air, the larger the fan, the greater the need. I'm showing an example, and actually Mart's going to speak to this a little bit later, so I'll, I'll move off of what it looks like. But it's a simple damper mechanism that dumps somewhere in the house, and we'll chat, chat about that just a little bit more in a second. And so it can be delivered anywhere into the house as long as there's a free pathway of air towards the kitchen. Doesn't need to be heated. I'm going to ask Stephen about that in just a second. But you do need to be aware of cool air concerns. By code, it doesn't need to be heated, but we'll talk about that. It does need to be powered open, spring closed. If you're thinking barometric damper that flaps in the breeze, it's going to do exactly that. The pressures we're talking about here, 25 Pascal, are such so light that even wind heading by a, a, a barometric damper is going to make it flap. So generally speaking, you're not going to have good feedback from homeowners if it's not 
uh, you're actually seeing there on the right hand side a makeup air that's dumped into the mechanical room of, of my cottage frankly it's a damper you can see the damper mechanism sort of at the bottom and it just vents freely into the house it's got a bird screen on it a bug screen on it and it's electrically interlocked to the range hood and in my case the dryer because it's a really tight house the dryer too creates a negative pressure and doesn't work very well so both either the dryer or the range hood will trigger the makeup air and it just opens a hole into the mechanic room and in comes the air and there are package units available Stephen. i know you do some of this 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 uh there are a couple of products on the market that have a a flow sensor and a heater and a fan associated with it, dampers built in, electrical interlock capabilities. That's where we're headed towards with when we say to make up here. By code doesn't need to be heated, but practically speaking, you may find that you want it heated. Here's one company named Electro Industries. I would encourage you out of, out of Northern Minnesota, Wisconsin. Again, another market that's historically had really good tight houses. So a manufacturing company there that's uh, understood that they, there's a little market here for uh, makeup air systems in houses. And that uh, that's sort of, I just wanted to outline the challenge and the problem, understanding that the tighter house you build, the high performance kitchens, it seems to me everybody's a gourmet chef these days and they all want multi burners. And I just wanted to, uh, Stephen, you, you run into this all the time and I'll ask you why that is for, perhaps at the outset. Um, and you face this challenge. Just um, describe for us what the kinds of challenges you face. Well, typically, Gord, uh, we build, most of our homes are built in the country. So we're always um, putting in wood stoves or, or uh, zero clearance fireplaces. And that requires, they're so tight. The home, Our homes are so tight, they're under one probably an average of 0.5. And um, they're so tight that when uh, you couple this uh, with a, a high performance range hood, it uh, causes a uh, downdraft. Um, and I'm I really- I'm gonna show that picture, St uh, Stephen. You guys often use, this is a great fireplace box, the Rumford, uh, Rumford box. It's just a beautiful, it's got a guillotine door, but still, it's subject to that five Pascal negative pressure. You've, you've experienced this. Actually in, in this home here, it, uh, there's two, uh, two, um, range hoods, one upstairs. Oh, right. you were, the, you'd ask me to show that. So in there's the range hood number so one. Here's the one on the main floor. That's a 650 CFM. Here's the one on the, the basement level. That's another 450 CFM. So when you do a depressurization test on this house, it uh, it required about uh, a thousand CFM of makeup air with the dryer going and everything. So typically uh, we ended up doing that with an eight inch pipe and brought it in and solved it with a with another test. Um, but what happens here is um, the homeowners or the designers are uh they want these uh specific range hoods to match their other appliances and the problem is that these typical ranges only come in certain sizes certain cfms so this is what causes causes a problem for us when we're building these homes all our homes are tested so uh we we know if it's going to be a depressurization problem or not so so the nice part is the right the you guys you know your air tightness levels you kind of know the the tolerance you have but I'll ask you who who chooses that kitchen appliance the kitchen range is that you is that your design team who's who's choosing that typically the homeowner chooses the range hood or the uh, supplier of the range or the appliances um, I'd make a recommendation of not to choose anything higher than 300 CFM. So we don't have these issues, but um, because a lot of these range hoods, I find that even their variable speed, but nobody ever turns them to 600 or 800, 900 CFM, that uh, they just don't use it that way. That becomes a problem with the noise and everything. So 
So they only run them at 300, but you have to size your makeup for the maximum amount. Yes. And we are all, we um, integrate that into the makeup air. So when the range hood is flipped on, the makeup air comes on automatically. Right. And and the good news is with tested houses, as I said, Stephen, because you know where your blower or test numbers are going to be, you can predict up front uh, how much uh, how much makeup air is going to be needed. Are you when you put it in? Are you heating that air? Where where are you putting that air? That makeup air. Typically, it depends on where we're putting the air back in. Um, sometimes we'll just put it back into the mechanical room, and we won't heat it there. But if we're putting it right back into, say, the kitchen area, we'll preheat it. Just temper the air enough to, with maybe one two kilowatt duct heater, just to temper it so it's not uh, causing discomfort. And that's important to understand. We don't necessarily have to heat it back up to 21 degrees. We simply need to heat it to a level where it's not going to cause discomfort. That's more about placement of the grill. We know from uh, other, um, you know, the ventilation standards that even if you can get the air to 10 or 12 degrees Celsius and put it up high in the kitchen, that that's that typically for short periods of time isn't going to cause uh, cause discomfort, which means you don't need huge amounts of heat uh, on that air. And as you say, most would say, let's just go into the mechanical room. As long as the mechanical room communicates freely through the floor joist system to the rest of the house, you, you can't put the makeup air into a room that's itself is airtight because the air can never get to the, where the range hood's exhausting. So it has to be what's considered to be a free pathway of airflow from the, um, from the makeup air to the, to the range hood. And, and so Stephen, you are having to work towards that five pascal limit because you're talking about combustion appliances most of your houses you would say put in a, a, a natural draft chimney in a lot of the country places yes they're all mostly a wood burning appliance right. um, and if you there's a real simple solution to this open the window when you turn the rain shit on <laughs> but we can't rely on that so uh and you know, in a wood burning fireplace, when you do turn that range hood on, and if you have that fireplace going, it's just instantly like that smoke comes down the chimney. It is interesting, isn't it? That the, the chimney is most vulnerable when you're starting because there's no warmth in the chimney. There is no buoyancy of warm air. The chimney actually works really well. It's actually a wood powered exhaust fan while it's burning. You can have a fire that's three, 400 degrees Fahrenheit easily, the chimney, and that's why you have to insulate chimneys type a chimneys uh, so dramatically because the chimney temperature could easily exceed five six hundred degrees fahrenheit and boy the chimney draws really well in fact it'll outdraw the rain should while it's burning the challenge is getting it started and frankly from a danger perspective <clears throat> the biggest challenge is when the fire dies down um, this is this is a where the the big concern comes is just as the evenings ended and and the fire's dying down. And as soon as it loses its flame, the, chim the temperature in the chimney drops dramatically. And now the buoyancy of that chimney is no longer there. And you have a propensity to backdraft. So I want you to imagine this. You've had a lovely day, you've had folks over, maybe out, uh, 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 out on the lake or you know, snowmobiling, whatever, turn the fire on, everybody's had a good evening. Uh, and then things die down and well, wow, we got to prepare for the next day. So let's put a load of laundry in and the dryer's running. Everybody goes to bed, the dryer's operating and the fire's died down. And now again, there's a negative pressure. So the range hood's an issue, sure. But at least you're running the range hood maybe while, while you're there. But if the dryer's on for a, an hour or two, it too is causing negative pressure. And that could be backdrafting almost inevitably. We'll backdraft that chimney at its most vulnerable time. That bed of coals is is just generating uh, significant amounts of carbon monoxide. And that's the most dangerous time of a fire is on the downturn. On the startup, you get it. The puff of smoke, it's not drafting. You open a window quickly and up, up, uh, up the air goes. But it's really the die down of the chimney that's the most dangerous. And I, I really appreciate, Stephen, you looking after the safety of your clients, trying to help them make that decision. Uh, you said you try to recommend under 300 CFM. How's that gone? Are people listening to that? Um, some do. Um, some don't. They just um, 
they want the matching range hood that matches the rest of their appliances. So if it's right. if the if the range says five star on it, the range hood should say five star on it, and that could be six to nine hundred to twelve hundred CFM. So right. You get into 1200 CFM, that's a real issue. Yeah, and we could play that game. Who's seen? You could put it in the chat. Who's seen the largest range hood? I think I've got a winner, uh, but uh, I'll I'll ask that later. So if you want to put it in the chat, the biggest range hood you've seen in a residential context, they'll give me a restaurant. But in a res residential context, tell me the largest range hood that you've got. You I brought up another interesting point, Stephen. On that house, it was one fireplace, it was two range hoods and a dryer. The depressurization test by your energy advisor, mm -hmm. depressurization, depressurization test must take into account, we call it worst case, not exactly worst case. It's always the ventilation system itself, like the HRV, it's got to be operating. The dryer and any exhaust appliance over a specific capacity, and that capacity is typically 250 CFM. It is outlined in the new F300 standard. I should go back and check it. But we're not saying that every exhaust appliance has to be on. You know, if somebody has a, a shop, a woodworking shop, and they have a fan for that, that doesn't necessarily have to be operating. But the dryer has to be operating because it runs for extended periods of time. And the next largest appliances have to be turned on um, as part of this. So as as unlikely as it might be that they're using both range hoods, uh, when you're doing your test, you'd have to turn both of them on. Correct. And if they're only using one range, range hood, you're going to pressurize the house then. Yeah, well, I would say if it's a passive, well, you're right. If you put in a fan system, a fan base, in order to keep yeah. the size of the hole down, yes, now you could be creating a positive pressure if you have a makeup air fan. If it's just a, if it's just a passive makeup air uh, with a damper opening, it, it, you won't create a positive. But if if using a fan base system, which is interesting to keep the size of that that opening down, uh, that that's something to to think about for sure. So you know these beautiful kitchens, these beautiful houses that you're building. And people, my own brother said to me in a cottage that we were building for the family. So you're going to go and make a house really dead nuts tight and then put a hole in the wall. Does that make any sense? Why don't we just go back to leaky houses? And Stephen, you would say, I don't want to build leaky houses because that's air that leaks all the time. This damper is only open when the range hood's on is, is kind of the approach. Yeah. Um, going back to my R2000 training, we're in the business to build comfortable homes, not not leaky homes. So. Right. That'll boy. So thank you for that. And we'll have time for questions with Stephen later. Stephen, thanks for sharing your experiences. You're on top of this, obviously. I know it can get annoying. It is a conversation you had to have with homeowners, maybe the kitchen designer, and then obviously on to your mechanical folks, electrician, and so on to get this installed. And I'm sure people are going to want to ask you later. So who does it and how much does it cost and so on? But we'll come back to that in, in just a little bit. Next, I want to turn our attention to so one, get rid of combustion appliances. Two, think about uh, putting in makeup air. But what if we could improve the performance of range hoods so that we didn't need as much air? Wouldn't that be kind of cool? And uh, because they're the leaders in the industry, the largest of the of the kitchen ventilation, at least residential kitchen ventilation in uh, in North America, I thought we'd have somebody from the uh, Brown Newton as an authoritative, authoritative voice. So we have Martin LaRock, who you met earlier, uh, Martin, take us away. Help us understand what's happening in this world of um, measuring and cap uh, the capture effectiveness of uh, of range hoods. Thank you, Gord. Sure. So, um, first of all, uh, capture efficiency. I, I I guess most of you have not heard about this. Uh, so, what what is it? So, it's a it's a new metric that's um that's been that's being introduced to to uh, to 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 have a rating on performance based on well capture efficiency so capturing the cooking fumes that you that you do when you're cooking actually uh cooking is the um you know is the uh is the single activity that can generate the most pollutant in your house so one cooking uh activity can generate 10 times the uh, the amount of uh you know 10 times the, the accepted limit in uh CO2, well, CO2 when if you're cooking over gas and a PM 2.5. So that's why it's important to have a range hood to capture those fumes. So the, right now, uh, what we have 
as a rating for ranges is, is based on, on, on uh, the uh, CFM performance. Um, the, uh, and, and those uh, CFM performance are, uh, the ratings are uh, done with the HVI, based on the HVI uh, uh, publication 915, which uh, tells you how to test those uh, range hood. Um, in Canada, HVI is not, uh, I, I, I don't think it's um, mandatory. Uh, but most of the, I would say most, I, I know all of our ranger at Bro Newton are HVI certified, not all of them that you can buy at a uh, hardware store are, but right now this is, this is the metric that is being used. So capture efficiency, the goal of capture efficiency is to, is to replace that metric with something that is, um, is going to tell you more about how efficient actually the ranger can be uh in capturing those those uh cooking fumes um it was first published in uh 2018 and it's based on 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 study that was done by uh, uh the lawrence berkeley lab in uh, california so more to this uh in a bit um so you know as i said the reason why you would want to have that that uh capture efficiency uh the current metric the cfm is is doesn't take into account the the range of design, the surface area, the filters design, the blower uh, type, the the size of that blower, the positioning. So um, I do have a few examples. If you can go to the next uh, slide, thank you. So for as an example, the um let's if you look at the surface area. So now we're we're looking at two different range hoods. Both of them are the same width, so 30 inch, which is uh, probably the, the most uh, the most standard uh, width used in the industry right now. Uh, as you can see, the depth is different. So the one on the top is a is 20 inch. So the the the, the portion underneath is 20 inch, and the other one um, is 18. So obviously, 18 inch, the surface area is is 11% smaller than the other one. So this is gonna affect your capture efficiency. Um, and because that surface area is smaller, the filters on that unit is also smaller. So the 18 inch uh, unit does have significant smaller surface area for the filters. So those two things affect your capture efficiency. Uh, next slide. Also, uh, another, another example of a bad design. So looking at this, this unit, you can see that the blower, first of all, you can see it's off center. And then um, the left filter, there's a very small gap between the filter and the, um, the panel. So basically making it that left side of the unit useless because there's not enough uh, uh, area to allow that that filter to be functional. This, so this is another thing that's affecting your capture efficiency. So other examples. So the two on the left, uh, the you can see that the um, the blower are off center, and the one on the right, you can see that the, the first of all, you can see that blower wheel is much bigger, and then it's centered. So this will uh, allow for a more balanced. Uh, capture efficiency on that on that unit when compared to the other two. So the the one on the left is it's not going to be that good on the left side, and the one in the middle, as you can see, the blower is on the left side. So the right side of the unit. If so, you can imagine if you're cooking, and you're using the right side of your stove, that unit is not going to be efficient at capturing that that um, uh, plume of 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 air coming up from from what whatever you're cooking. Um, and actually, this these are uh, numbers um, to to show you the difference uh, that you where what you can get in terms of difference in terms of uh, efficiency. So the 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 unit, the brown unit with that that bigger wheel and the sa centered uh, that was centered in the unit, you you could at one eighty five cfm. So it's approximately the rating of that unit you have 92% uh, capture efficiency. The other one, uh, even though the CFM rating is higher, 
So the, that that USA model, the, the the one that we were, where the filter was very close to that panel, is rated at two hundred CFM. So looking at the CFM alone, you would you would think that that unit would perform better, but in reality, it, it's at eighty five percent capture efficiency, so seven percent lower than the other unit, which has a, a lower CFM rating. So as you can see, CFM rating doesn't tell you the whole story in, in, in terms of the, uh, what that range hood can do in terms of capture efficiency. That's why, you know, the industry is pushing, actually California is uh, pushing right now to, to get this uh, rating uh, used. Really, California pushing the envelope on standards, and that's a who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> They're always at the forefront, I, I guess, of uh, uh, you know, um, pushing those standards, and they uh, they keep they keep us uh, very busy. Uh, I would yeah. say <laughs> yeah. adapting to all those new uh, requirements that they came up with. Yep. All right. So another example of of a bad design is uh, OTR. So OTRs are over the range uh, microwave. So I, I know these are very useful when you have limited amount of, uh, uh, you know, space in your kitchen. And I do say that because I, I actually have one in my in my home and I know they're not that good for capture efficiency, but you know, that's what I have. Um, but why are they so bad? Because first of all, by design, the depth of those units is usually 16, 16 uh, inches. And the other thing is that if you look underneath, the surface area of those, the filter used in those units is very small. Uh, it's not even, you know, it's not even 30% of the surface area uh, underneath the unit. So, so far preliminary testing that we've done uh, show that OTRs are 15 to 20% uh, they lower in capture efficiency as opposed to a typical uh, under cabinet range. So let's say you, you go to a store, you buy an OTR unit, uh, 300 CFM unit, you compare it to a uh, 300 CFM uh, under cabinet range hood, chances are that you're, you're gonna get 15 to 20% lower capture efficiency. So. Very interesting. Um, so I'm I'm just gonna this is gonna be a bit maybe a bit more technical. So how how capture efficiency is measured? Well, it's measured in a test chamber. It's a sealed test chamber. Um, what what's done? It's um well you ins the the uh they they introduce a uh, uh, a tracer gas usually it's CO two, um and that tracer gas is injected uh through uh injection plates, and the whole thing is uh, designed to simulate a uh, kitchen area. So the capture efficiency is measured, you know, so they're measuring the, what's the, the, the range that can capture, so the uh, CO2 at the exhaust, so the, at the CO2 at the inlet of that room, because they're, you know, depressurization during the test is, is also uh, measured. And then there, there is, um, uh, measurement done uh, in the chamber. So the, the the this shows you how it's calculated. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So this shows you a typical uh, capture efficiency uh, test chamber. Uh, the picture that you see on the left is actually the test chamber that we do have here at uh, the uh, in Venmar and Drummondville. Um, and and the, the sketch on the uh, on the right shows you what that test chamber looks like the dimension everything is um, um, you know there's everything is um, has to be within those uh, dimensions uh, and as I, as I said the goal is to duplicate a typical um, kitchen area where you would do your cooking and the um, the red dot that you see, is where the um the reading of CO2 uh for the the uh the the room is is uh located and the reason it's there it's because it's just in front of the uh your the you know the cooktop it, and the goal is to simulate the uh 
uh, average uh, human position when they're doing cooking. So that's that's where, you know, and, and on average where a person would that would be cooking would be located. So that's why that's the uh, where the, the that CO two measurement is done, and you can see those uh, plate uh, emitter plate. Um, those are uh, heated up at 160 degrees uh, while the gas is being uh, introduced into them. And uh, also the goal to do that is to simulate something being cooked on those uh, on that cooked up. Very cool. Uh, when, when we're doing the test, everything is monitored and controlled. So uh, the temperature, humidity, um, the emitter gas uh, flow rate, the temperature of those uh, plates I was telling you about, the chamber depressurization. So this is also controlled because we know when we're testing, let's say you're testing a range of uh, of uh, uh, 200 uh, CFM, obviously that room's not that big. So you're gonna get huge depressurization if you're not controlling it. So that's why we have uh, also inlets that uh, for which we control the uh, uh, airflow in order to keep that depressurization within five uh, below, well, actually below five Pascal. Um, and, and you can see everything is monitored. Uh, this, this shows you uh, a bit of, of, of uh, uh, what the test uh, result, well, while the test is being done, actually, you know, we, we can measure in real time how uh, it does very and a uh, typical test is about, I would say, over an hour. Uh, one of the um, requirement of the test is to do at least four air room air change before we start uh, measuring, before the, the actual measurement can start. So um, depending on the, the CFM of the range hood, uh, to get to that four uh, uh, room air change can take uh, 15 to 20 to 25 minutes. And then after that, the, 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 the test, the uh, measurement for the test, that's where we, we uh, look at them and, you know. Nice. So I guess the question is, the other question, if capture efficiency is way much better to, um, you know, in terms of uh, performance, why is it, is it used? It's not. Why not? Well, the um, standard, the current standard, the uh, uh, 2018 version that was uh, introduced um, by ASTM, um, the issue is that it's not R and R, so meaning it it's not it does not repeat uh, the results. So um, when we test the same range hood in the same condition. Uh, you you will get different results. So right now, uh, so and and you know they realized that when they, they, they that standard came up, that different lab were getting different results. Uh, so because of that, in 2020, uh, a work group was put together to review the whole uh, standard. Uh, right now, the that that. Uh, the, the work is still ongoing. Um, there are four labs um, that are participating in that uh, effort. There is the LBNL, uh, the Berkeley lab in California. There's a real lab in uh, a -N -A -N, parts of a and uh, University in, in Texas. Uh, there's the Intertech lab uh, in collaboration with AM and, and in New York. And then there's a Bro Newton uh, Venmar lab in Drummondville, so uh, this is why I'm I'm being involved because we do have a lab here in in in, in Drummondville, and as far as I know, these are the four, these are the only labs that do have test chamber in North America, and uh, I, I don't think there is anybody else right now in North America that that, that does have those test chamber, and in Canada, Bro Newton is the only one that does have a, a, one of those test uh, chamber. Um, as I said, the the uh, the work group has been working since 2020, trying to resolve. We had a a, a bunch of uh, issues to go through, trying to figure out why we were not uh, getting re 
you know, good results. Um, right now, where we stand, uh, early 2024, the round robin testing, so interlab testing, uh, should start. Uh, and I right now the the, the um, standard has been revised, uh, but you know we we need to go through those uh, testing to validate that that you know we get uh, repeatable uh, results between labs. Um, estimated date right now publication probably at the end of twenty twenty four, and then after that it probably uh, come in, come into effect in 2025 i don't have any dates now cuz you know it's been so long. <laughs> we've been working on this for so long um but you know um this is this is the status of um the uh what's going on with that uh standard very cool so although the the um uh, it's still not published we have done a lot of testing and what those are preliminary findings of those testing sh are showing is that at 160 CFM, you can expect to get a capture efficiency between 75 and 80. All, obviously, this is always uh, depending on the on the design of, of the unit, but this is for, let's say, a typical uh, under cabinet range hood. Um, 300 CFM, you should be above 90%. And at 400, you're gonna be above 95, almost 100 uh, most of the time. So it, this tells you that range hood, technically, it, you don't need to be you know, above, I would say 300 or 400 CFM, because if, if you get there, you're gonna be uh, at very close to 100. Uh, percent in capture efficiency. So that, that's what it's uh, telling us right now. Uh, so that's, that's uh, I don't know if... Uh, well, and then okay. you had mentioned that the, the over-the-range microwave, because they're narrower, because the filter area, they typically have a much lower capture efficiency. They do. They do. They're, as I, you know, it's 15 to 20% below. Uh, you can expect numbers in those range um th this is due to their design uh obviously as i was showing also also earlier there there are uh units uh ranger that are not the design is not that good in terms of capture efficiency so they're also on going to be underperforming but uh you know that's that's what can be expected in terms of uh uh, capture efficiency. And then I'd already mentioned makeup air, but you just yeah. wanted to a, a couple of <laughs> elements that you and I can discuss together. But mm -hmm. we already talked about what makeup air is and trying to find that over to the right there, that optimal balanced air pressure. You don't want the house to go too negative. Uh, we already know what the effects of negative pressure are, either the backdrafting or the annoyance of drafts and so on. And um, you you were just showing a couple of examples. But but I, what I find interesting is Brown kind of stepped up and said, hey, we can help with this makeup air. Just describe a little bit about the resources that Brown has available on the makeup air side. Sure. So um, Brown Newton uh, does have a lot of resourceful uh, documentation available. Um, sadly, well, not sad. Well, the thing is, if you go to the Canadian version of our website, you might not get all the information but the trick is to go on the U.S. side of our uh, website where uh, you will have all those uh, interesting uh, documentation. So um, I, I did put the link in, in, in uh, the, um, the uh, presentation. So uh, I don't know, Gord, if this is going to be distributed afterwards. Yes. But uh, if, if, if not, it's easy. You just go to uh, the Brown Newton uh, website. Uh, just make sure you select the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, website, and then you just type in Makeup Air, and uh, it's going to bring you to a selection of Makeup Air. We do have a bunch, but the the where you'll have a bit more information is the, uh, the if you select uh, at the universal version, and then at the bottom of that that uh, page, you're going to have a link 
to those documents. So you, we do have an application guide, um, which gives you a, a lot of information on, on when, why uh, you, you should have a makeup, uh, makeup error. Uh, we do have a, a, also a documentation on the automatic version that we have. So, and then the, 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 the other one is the fact sheet. So all of this is available uh, uh, on the Brown New Tone uh, website. Um, Thank you. Yep. And then and, you had mentioned, I'd asked, uh, are the range hoods now, one of the challenges with makeup air is I got to find a way to interlock it to the, to the range hood. Some of your range hoods now have that interlock capability built in. Is that correct? Um, yes and no. Well, we we uh, <laughs> we use we used to have our lineup um, of range hood with the automatic. Well, the enter connection um, is getting well. We're we're renewing our our uh, lineup of uh, units and. More and more, what we realize is that people are just using the universal version of the makeup error. So this is, I guess, the easiest way to do it because these are being universal. They can be used with basically any any range. It doesn't have to be Ebro Newton. It can be any any model, any company, any and and the way they work is that they cut the the kit uh, available in six inch, eight inch, and ten inch. They come up. In the, with the uh, pressure switch that you installed on the uh, exhaust of the range hood, uh, they come up with the uh, transfo and the the, the uh, makeup area itself. So it's a it's a complete uh, kit that allows you to basically um, use on on any range hood. So, uh, but we still do have a few units. I would say it's more in the pro lineup. So the the uh, you know not not the um. Uh, I don't think we have any in the uh, prosumer or, or you know average consumer uh, lineup, but the, the pro line we do have some that uh, allows to be connected directly. Uh, those twelve hundred CFM type unit, uh, some of them do have it. So I'm going to uh, preempt. I'm sure we're going to get some questions, but I'll preempt a little bit and say. Somebody's going to say, well, can't we just have a device in the house that manages the pressure as different appliances come on automatically? Couldn't we measure the pressure across the house and have fans turn on and off accordingly? And what we need to know is that the pressures across the house, across the building envelope, change very dramatically based on wind and stack effect and other uh, other elements, wind. And, uh, and it's really difficult to do with the pressure sensitivity. And we've tried this. This is was looked at, there was a research project about uh, 40 years ago, 35 years ago that I was involved with, uh, with uh, at that time, Energy Minds and Resources, you know, create a, an HRV or ERV that had one big different fans in it with pressure switches. And, and it just wasn't reliable. More importantly, it changed every, literally every five minutes, the dampers were moving. It was very annoying. Um, and and more recently, uh, Brown had a, a, a I know had a research project on this too. So when you see this pressure switch there on the left by the damper itself, what it's doing is it's really a flow proving switch or a flow indication switch. It's basically telling you the range hood is on, and you could do that electrically, except you wouldn't know what speed it's at. The pressure switch is simply indicating okay, there's air leaving the range hood. So open up the makeup air. It's not necessarily matched as Stephen indicated. It doesn't know how much air it's exhausting. All it's telling you is the range hood is on. That's what it's intended for. And in that mode, it's actually pretty darn reliable. It doesn't take a lot of maintenance and you can set it, its sensitivity such that it, it's, um, it's not just opening and closing all the time. So that's the, you're not measuring the pressure across the envelope. You're measuring that there's flow in the exhaust of the range hood. And you're going to say, well, that's greasy. Could that get dirty? Yes, it could. But the, uh, my experience has been over the last seven to 10 years that the flow switch is because it's, uh, I would say, rugged and durable enough. And it's all it's trying to do is measure flow. It ends up being pretty darn uh, reliable. I haven't had to do much maintenance on it at all. So th that's why that universal kit is, is kind of handy. This one, Stephen isn't heated in, in this case. Um, and in your case, you would say, hey, if I want to heat that air, 
I would rather than hooking it to this damper, I would hook it to that, say that electro industries box, but it would still use that same kind of flow proving switch that uh, that we're looking at here. Uh, and and so uh, Martin, thank you very much. I know there'll be questions. Um, it is kind of cool to know that at some point we'll get away from Stephen. You've now heard kind of definitively three to four hundred CFM probably gets you where you need to be. It'd be nice to have that proof, right, at the at kitchen designer level, where homeowners are choosing not on CFM but choosing on an efficiency rating. So nice to know it'll be out. Of course, we would say do it quicker, but um, nice to know that that standard is on its way. And it sounds like it's pretty uh, pretty good cross industry, right? You've had lots of support from the industry overall. Yeah, we do. Uh, it's uh, the, the work group right now also includes uh, people from the uh, um, Euro European, uh, the uh, IEC, which uh, we're coordinating with them. So the uh, standard um, is also going to be published. Uh, they're going to have their version for Europe, and then we're going to have uh, the North American version. Both of them are going to be aligned. So we're we're working in collaboration with them. And um, as I said, there's a, a lot of people involved in this. So uh, okay. expert, you know, uh, researcher. So it's a... It's a good, uh, you know, it's a good effort. I think right. it's, it's, we're getting there. <laughs> good. Um, and we'll just do a quick uh, summary slide. And, and I'll just remind you of, you know, the challenges. Houses, you want houses, you want good air bears in your houses. You want houses to be tighter. Homeowners seem to be gravitating towards larger exhaust appliances. Or in any house, there's going to be an exhaust appliance. I've really appreciated what Martin said. The, the pollutants off a range hood, as much as they may smell great, the pollutants off a range hood end up being the single biggest occupant indoor air quality uh, emitter, if you will. The VOCs, um, the oils, the uh, natural gas, if you're using natural gas, but even if it's not natural gas appliance, you, this is this is an important air quality uh, source or a problem for air quality, and you want to exhaust at the source. So it, very powerful to do that, but finding that right airflow and Stephen intuitively had this idea three to 400 that he can kind of manage in his tight houses. Um, now you're seeing a little more definitive uh, answer on that, that, that first and foremost, you would say, I want to switch as much as possible to direct vent sealed combustion appliances. So I don't at least have combustion safety issues, but if somebody wants a wood burning appliance and nothing wrong with that, that's still a, a nice idea. So we're going to have to meet a specific limit on that one of five Pascal. But even if you don't have combustion spills appliance, you still have this minus 25 Pascal limit because of the annoyance of and the restriction on the range hood itself. And second is to help clients choose range hoods with better capture efficiencies and lower over, uh, overall exhaust flow rates. And I'll say again, your houses, if you're blower door testing your houses, it's a very relatively quick exercise to work with your energy advisor to say, what is the number in my houses? Knowing the size of the houses I build, the tightness of the houses that I build, what should I be recommending? And if it's in that three to 400 CFM range, then you can reliably say to your client, that's sounding pretty good. You, got, you can have an expectation, assuming it's properly designed hood, you can have a reasonable expectation of a capture of efficiencies over 95%. Um, and so you're in good shape. And then um, use those blower door test results to identify the need for and the size of that makeup air to stay below that 25 Pascal negative pressure. And you now know there's resources associated with that, uh, both the F300 standard, the Brown Newtone resources and manufacturers who have solutions for you. So uh, th thank you uh, both Stephen and, and Martin. Uh, we'll have time for four questions on this. We're perfect on timing. Um, let's go to our questions and answers. Stacey, I'll leave this uh, leave this up. Um, I will mention this one. Well, actually, I'll go back to this one just so we're on the same topic before I go to the next. Um, Stacey, help us with uh, questions. I just want to remind everyone that if you are putting questions in the chat, I'm going to need you to copy and paste those over into the q and I just saw a really big one come in there. Gord, um, 
Let's start off with the first one with uh, David from Guelph. Thank you. How do you interconnect an ERV to provide makeup air? So we've got a lot of questions here on the ERV stuff, yeah. as you predicted. So this is a question I've been answering since 1984. And we actually built four natural, at that time, Energy Mines Resources, an ERV with a 100 CFM fan on the exhaust side. And then normally 100 CFM fan on the supply side. But if the range hood goes on, that's 300 CFM. Okay, now that fan has to be 400. And if the dryer goes on, that's another 150. So now that fan has to be, uh, 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 sorry, 550 CFM. So we ended up with this HRV, one side 100 CFM fan, the other side a 550 CFM fan. And you go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't really work. And more importantly, if I bring 550 CFM of air through the ERV, and only 100 CFM of exhaust, guess what happens to the core? In about 30 seconds flat, it turns into an icebox. And so we realized, and in fact, there was a, a meeting convened on this with Combustion Safety, the Gas Association was there and others, who said, actually, each appliance should look after itself. It's not fair to saddle this with, they thought it, they'd saddle the HRV industry with it, because you guys are new, you should be able to do this. Well, one, we didn't have the fan motor technology to be able to turn it from 550 to 450 to 300 to 100. Now we have that technology. We still don't have the technology to measure the pressures at those different levels accurately enough. And it just turned into this giant box with a giant duct on one side and a small duct on the other. The ERV is de designed to be balanced. 100 CFM in, 100 CFM out, out of balance by maybe 10%. Okay, that's 10 CFM. It's not got enough air in it to make up for a 400 CFM range hood, 150 CFM dryer, so on and so on. So sorry to tell you, can't be done. Now in commercial, in commercial with large appliances and so on, it may be possible, but in residential, just not there, sorry. And Stephen, you would ask that question. You've been looking for that same device. Yeah, it would be nice if you had one box to solve, solve it all. And it's... Um, could you build the bypass underneath the ERV so that it kind of went in the same box? Maybe that might be possible. But to yeah. imagine two fans in that box, one that's varying and one that's staying constant, really tough to do. The other one. Well, of that the things, oh, sorry. Uh, ahead, one Steven. of the things that you're always fighting with in uh, in homes is uh, finding space to exhaust because your intake and your exhaust have to be certain six feet apart. So um, you're always. Uh, you're always fighting for that space. You know, always, especially in townhouses and so on. I will yeah. say that six feet is kind of an interesting number. You won't actually find that in codes or standards anywhere. Everybody says six feet. You go looking for it in section 932 of the code, you won't find it. What you will find is a one meter space between a fresh air intake and contaminated air, like oil fill pipes, gas vents, and so on. But in fact, all of the code says is shall be located so as to avoid cross-contamination. And the new F326 ventilation standard makes that more clear. So there's a new version of this F300. There's also a new version of the F3, sorry, F326 ventilation standard. And it makes it more clear about this six feet. I happen to know where the six feet came from. Big tall Dutch guy by the name of Dick Van E, who was designing the HRVs in the early days, Somebody said how far apart they should be. Big, tall Dutch guy puts his arms apart like that. They measure it and they go, okay, that's about six feet. Let's make it six feet. And it it shows up in manufacturer's literature, but it's actually not in code. That's just a bit of a uh, myth, I guess. Sorry about that. Um, next question, please. Well, I was just, just saying that that kind of goes on to Norman's question, asking if you could just put it on boost mode whenever the range hood is on as an effective makeup unit. Right. But as you imagine, boost method is both fans in the ERV go to 200 CFM from 100 to 150 or 200. It hasn't helped you. He said, well, just turn one of the fans to boost. Okay, you got yourself an extra 100 CFM, but the range hood was 400, so you're still 300 out of balance. So similar question. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, David's uh, asking another question about the airtight wood-burning stoves. We normally provide a duct for combustion air direct from the outside. Are there other recommendations? Ah, that's a, a really good question. The combustion air, and you kind of, that's why I showed that water heater. There's, again, that that fireplace has two different types of air that it needs. It needs combustion air, relatively small amount of air that's used 
that's used up, burned up in the combustion process. That's why you put that in. It's not the biggest portion of air. The biggest portion of air is the dilution air that's going up to regulate the flow of the chimney. That's hundreds of CFM. Now in airtight wood stoves, they've done a nice job and they need far less dilution air, only a hundred CFM or so. The problem is that's just getting you into the chimney itself. The chimney is still relying on, on the buoyancy of warm air, or hot air, and that's still only a pressure, it can only overcome a pressure, a pressure of five Pascal. So airtight, really good, like the one you use, Stephen, wow, uses a very small amount of air and it's great. It doesn't exhaust a lot of air out of the house. So that's great. But its chimney is still subject to the same five Pascal negative pressure. It's not the amount of air. It's the pressure that that chimney can overcome. So even an airtight wood stove needs its combustion air, still needs makeup air, not for airflow. It's not air that's going up the chimney. It's air that's going out the range hood that manages the pressure. So we don't have it yet. A, a, a wood stove, a pellet stove, any of those appliances that have been able to uh, rate their chimneys at a pressure less, sorry, more than five Pascal negative. So it doesn't really help you. Uh, again, I love the airtight wood stoves, by all means use them. They exhaust less air out of the house, but they don't solve your combustion spillage issue. Okay. Uh, Lindsay asked, during the design phase, what should we assume as the ACH at 50 pascals to determine the air leakage? Should we assume lower, knowing the builder will do better than code without a blower door test? Good question, Stephen. Um, you have some sense of where you are for air tightness. I think you have some sense of code. Um, I, I, I believe, I believe um, most of the, when you're doing the design, they're usually uh, designed to the minimum of, say, net zero is 1.5. So if you want to go out on a limb and say your builder is going to go down to 0.5, then that's up to you, up to the designer. And and, the, and thank you for that, Stephen, because that's exactly where the F300 standards have gone, is it's giving advice to the designers to say, ask your builder, are you blowed or testing your houses? Get a sense of where they're at and choose a number and put that on your specification. Stephen would say, I'm a 0.5 builder because many of us houses get to that level. Other builders would say, I'm nowhere close. Uh, design mine at three, please, and I'm good to go. So the F300 standard does allow you to make some assumptions, and then it, it asks you to uh, prove that out, or at least make statements that would say, these are the assumptions I've made. Okay, Peter's asking, are there risks to depressurization in all electric homes, for example, building envelope failures? Um, Martin, you may be able to answer this. The, the, the range hoods themselves are never going to operate at a pressure large enough to cause damage to an envelope. I, mean, there, it, it, I think that's a fair statement. I I, I think it is. It's it, yeah. understanding that wind pressures can be 150 to 300 Pascal of pressure. We're talking about 25, 50 Pascal of pressure. So the negative pressure isn't impacting the durability of the enclosure. What it's really impacting is the performance of the fan. Well, if if you're talking about the um, the only negative effect that I could see is if you don't have any makeup system. Um, so a range of which, you know, uh, a larger range of uh, it's it's. I guess during summer you you would have humidity being drawn yeah. through the the uh, the envelope, but apart from that, I don't see anything bad happening. That, that to does, the, yeah. And, and that raises a good question, something we should address. We'll watch our timing here, but people say, do I have to account for the range hood in my HVAC design? Like, do I have to put in a furnace big enough? And the answer is no. It's considered an intermittent appliance. Stephen heats it for comfort reasons. You don't have to put in a large enough furnace to bring it in because it's only running. Now in a restaurant, no, restaurant that fan's running all day. So they have to allow for heating of that air so the place doesn't cool off, the restaurant doesn't cool off. Uh, to Martin's point, yeah, you don't want that moisture coming in in the summer, but it's only coming in for 20 minutes. So, or half an hour, an hour. It's not that big a deal. Um, so it's not gonna affect the enclosure. 
it typically won't have much effect on your mechanicals. Again, the issue is the annoying drafts and most importantly, the range hood not delivering the amount of air you thought it was going to deliver. But Gord, it will yep. uh, affect, it will affect it in the winter time because your doors could it will freeze shut. Ah, uh, the you you could have again. I I think Steve and I would say it's unusual for a range hood to run long enough. Yeah. To cause that problem, it would be more an imbalance of the HRV. If the HRV was imbalanced and creating a negative pressure over a twenty four hour period or positive pressure, that might be. But Intermittent appliances are exactly that. They're not designed to run for hours and hours, but I, I guess it could have. Yeah. Okay, Dave, Dave is asking, how do you air test a house when there are no appliances in the house? Uh, good question. Again, the blower door, before you put the range hood in or the dryer in, you can go to your designer, Stephen, right? You, and say, what range hood do you want to put in? It, that's That's what you would do, I presume. Yeah. And then he would compare that to his blower door numbers and say, yep, that's going to exceed. So we better plan for make up air. So you make an assumption. Stephen's going to say, I'm a 0.5. You can predict even before the house is built, if he's going to be 0.5 air changes, I can do the calc. Your energy advisor can do the calc and tell you how much air you're going to be allowed. So even before the house is built, you could put it right on the plants based on the air tightness 0.5, the size of this building, no larger than a three, four, 500 CFM range. It, it's a fairly easy exercise for an energy advisor to do. Okay, David's wanting to know when homeowners dry their laundry on a portable rack in the house adding humidity, is it possible to have a ventilation system or exhaust grill in the area? Um, thank you. Uh, Martin, you're gonna wanna talk ventilation overall. And historically, ERVs, HRVs were ducted bathrooms, laundry rooms, even to the kitchens, and you'd put in a kitchen research. The code calls for supplemental ventilation in kitchens and baths. It doesn't actually specify amount, um, but absolutely, there's nothing wrong with fully ducting. Martin, any comments on that? I know HRVs and ERVs aren't your area of expertise, but nothing wrong typically with saying go moisture itself isn't a huge pollutant. Duct the HRV, is that okay on the exhaust side? Martin, is that familiar? Well, it's I'm I'm more into range hood, but yes. yes I... <laughs> and and maybe maybe I'll ask it this way. How do you feel about a recirculation range hood and an HRV vent in the kitchen? And you're gonna tell me I, I'm okay yeah, with Yeah, I, I'm I, I would be okay, but you know, you would need to have um your uh HRV or, uh, or ERV uh sized according to what's what's required required to you know so in in recirculation um i guess the, one of the issues is that um you do have filters on on those range hood and and uh, when they're used in recirculation they use uh charcoal uh, uh type uh filters to help uh you know catch uh odors and but it's Obviously, those are not 100%. So you need to have the, this your uh, HRV or ERV sized according, taking this into account, because you're going to dump that uh, polluted air back into your house. And as I said, when you're cooking, that's when you're gener generating uh, most of the pollutant in your house. So that's why um, I'm, I'm, I'm more for ducting it outside. But I the know right volume uh, through the outside. And thank you for yeah. that. We're a little short of time, but I yeah. took your comment. Uh, I, I really uh, 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 enjoyed your comment that 10 times, right? It's it's this is a huge pollutant source. We would rather exhaust it out at the source rather than letting it get into the room. The the laundry is a little different because it's it's maybe some fabric softeners and moisture over a longer period of time. So maybe you'd want to do that. But you want to gravitate towards a fully ducted range hood is what you'd like to get to. Um, we we'll only have about another minute, uh, but um, uh, uh, we will answer questions online. That is all right an out answers. Is there one more or two more, Stacy, that we should answer? Yeah, what I was thinking is there were a couple code questions here. Um, one asking if the National Building Code will adopt the new F300 standard yet. 
and one whether the makeup air damper will be mandatory in the future part nine requirements. You wanna wrap up with those two? I'll, I'll say the F300, always the goal of every standard ever published is to get referenced in the code. And I was speaking <laughs> to uh, Martin, uh, sorry, to uh, Marshall Leslie yesterday, I bumped into him at the build show or builder show. And he said, yeah, we're pretty close to getting F300 referenced in the code. So that'll be useful. Um, I'm not sure that makeup air, well, it, that's interesting. Stephen, you do make up air in a lot of houses. Could you imagine it being code at some point to say this is a big enough problem? Yeah, I could say it's a good idea to allow for a six inch duct, which will accommodate most things. Just rough it in. If you can if you need to downsize it, downsize it. Or if you don't need it, don't use it. Don't use it. I, I like that idea. I do think the codes will at some point talk about the the pressures they do now already. They're implied. F300, F326 is already referenced in the code. And it talks about builders being responsible for pressure differences in houses. So that doesn't mean all houses are going to need makeup air, but you're going to have to do a calculation to say, I don't need it. One one thing that uh, everybody should be testing their houses, air testing their houses, um, especially if they have a wood burning appliance in or or anything that could be susceptible. Um, there's a huge liability if something ever happened here, and it's I, the liability liabilities on the builder. I I love that. Thank you, Stephen. I'm always gratified. We get a phone call a couple of times a year, a wood stove company north of us that's very very diligent if they're putting a wood stove into somebody's house they have that homeowner call us first to do a depressurization test because they don't want the liability and i'm so thankful for that these are wet certified i don't know if you know that wood energy technology technology training i think it's called and they've recognized that you're putting in a wood stove natural draft chimney you should know about the pressure regime in that house do some testing um, so I just want to say to um, to uh, uh, Martin and Stephen, thanks so much, Martin, specifically. I really appreciate your work on the new standard. Uh, we're going to expect it by end of 2024, maybe 25. Thank you for that. Very important piece. And then Stephen's going to look at it and hand his homeowners and say, see, you don't need more than three to 400 CFM. And then, uh, and Stacey, thanks for organizing as always. And then I will just point you to uh, December 14th, uh, another really cool, session I get to be involved with, you know, a little piece on large building air tightness testing. You're going to hear from Kyle and Mike and Josh about some buildings they've been working on uh, and testing. And you're going to find that, I'm going to say really interesting, especially since a lot of builders are doing more and more multi-family, larger buildings, mid-rise and so on. So please join us for that particular session. And then we would say sign up for our um, digest uh, because we send out a uh, a, a package or at least a, a, a digest with industry highlights and so on and so on. So by all means, sign up. Stacy. you'll remind folks that this session is coming to them um, and, and uh, you'll send out the survey monkey and send out a copy of the presentation. I noticed a couple of typos, at least two, and my apologies for that. I'll take thank that you. on, And uh, but we'll get that done. And, and uh, 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 thank, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, and, and the questions we didn't get to today, Gordon and I will work behind the scenes to get those answered for those people, and uh, we'll answer you. Um, so they, they were important questions, too. We just didn't have enough time to get to them all today. Yes, exactly. Thank awesome. you all for attending. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Thank thanks, Martin. I really appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Bye now. Bye. Bye.